The music today was so beautiful because it tied so neatly to everything I want to say to you. And when I finally went to bed last night, I was totally unsatisfied with what I had planned to preach. And so when I got up early this morning, I scrapped that, decided to start over and find something that I thought was more in line where I could be at peace in my own soul. You know, it isn't a matter of just coming up here and unloading something on you and saying, well, I did my job. It's a matter of sensing what the needs are and following what the Spirit of God would direct in order to meet your needs on a level that is in accordance with His will. I talked to Jack after the first service when we were talking about the song the kids did, talking about the songs that he did, and thinking about how that all has wired together with what I want to say. It is so important that we arrive at a place where we are ready to praise the Lord just because of who he is. That is an amazing step of maturity on our part. Any kid can thank us for something we do for them. But it's a sign of maturity when our kids arrive at a place where they are ready to say, thank you for being who you are to me. I listened to a tape yesterday. I had been with a bunch of fellows that worked for me in the 60s and 70s. We had a couple of days of reunion over at the coast. And I had been unable to attend the memorial service for Dale Daniel, who was a great help to us in the early years of Youth for Christ and whose son, Doyle, worked for me for a number of years. Dale recently went to be with the Lord. I was in Sacramento at the time of the service. But I knew that Doyle had spoken at his father's service. And I asked him for a copy of what he had to say, and he brought me a tape, and I listened to it coming home yesterday. And listen to this man talk about the tremendous impact of his father on his life in so many different ways. But he summed it all up by saying, it wasn't just the things he did, it was who he was. That was the impact of his life. When we begin to understand that we need to praise God for who he is, we need to be in touch with Jesus, understanding how he wants to communicate with us and the various roles he wants to play in our lives. And until you'll give yourself to growth in the Word of God, you will never arrive at a place where you are understanding who He is enough to take time just to praise Him. The verse I want to use is one we usually use at Christmas time. I'm not rushing the season. I'm lifting it out to help us follow in a way that may bring us to a better place of maturity. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 reads like this, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. These will be his royal titles. And I want to take what normally we call the first two and put them together. I've always felt like they wanted to be together, and I've found some fellows that agree with my thinking on this. His titles shall be Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I want to just look briefly at those four titles and then ask you some questions in your life in regard to these four titles. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. I think that all of us see ourselves in some little arena as people who have done counseling for those who have come to us to ask for our great wisdom. Now that may not be a large group, but I'm sure there's a little group somewhere that comes to you and says, please uh, share with me your wisdom. I think of an instance inside this congregation a year and a half ago, or maybe two years ago, 
Louis Herwald had been asked by our North Fresno Rotary Club to become the president, and he had accepted that in a weak moment. And that was still months ahead of us, and he came to me and he said, I don't know about this thing of being president of the Rotary Club. And I said to him, Louis, it's not your thing. They caught you in a weak moment. You said yes. You've still got time to tell them you made a dumb decision. Tell them no and get that thing off your back. And he said, thank you very much. And he came back to me three or four days later and he said, you know, I, I thought about that and I've prayed about it and I feel that I told them I would. I've given them my word and so I'm going to go ahead. And I thought, now isn't that something? I tell one of my really good friends, give him some great advice, and he promptly goes and does something else. And he had a great year as president of the club. See, Louis is the kind of a Rotarian that used to just come to the club, quietly eat his lunch, pay whatever fines he was assessed, and then go back to work and do his job. Never made any ruckus or any fuss in that club. He became president, and most guys, Louis is a hard guy to get to know, in case you didn't know that. But as president of that club, somehow he opened up a whole new world of people seeing another side of him. And the amazing thing is what God is doing now, that he has finished his term as president. All kinds of doors are open with men who need to know Christ and they are seeing him in a different role and are open to him to open the word of God with them. It's beautiful. And all my wonderful advice was trash. <laughs> and he had enough insight to know that. No matter how exalted we get, we really have to come down to the fact that we are not wonderful counselors a good share of the time. We try. But in Jesus, you can rest secure that he is a wonderful counselor. There are three things true of any counsel that he gives. It's always based on truth. It is always righteous and holy. And it is always practical. The advice that Jesus gave to people always fulfilled those three things. I think about one of the fellows Jack sang about. I think the rich young ruler who came to Jesus. Asked the right question, got the right answer, made the wrong decision, couldn't handle it. And the scripture says that young man walked away sorrowfully for he was very rich. And the scripture also says that Jesus sadly watched him go for he loved him very much. But the thing that Jesus did not do was to run and catch him and say, I think we can work out a different deal for you. He had given him the truth in righteousness and in holiness and had told him what he had to do in order to find eternal life. I think about the woman at the well who had said to Jesus, and here was this woman whose life was really one raunchy mess. And she said, I know that someday the Messiah will come. And Jesus looked at her and said, I am the Messiah. And she accepted that from him. And immediately went to others and said, come and meet a man that's told me everything I've ever done. And in so doing, she brought scores of people to the Lord Jesus Christ because she listened and believed what he had to say. I think of Jesus as he hung on the cross. And the one criminal on the one side said, hey, why don't you save yourself and while you're at it, save us too? And the criminal on the other side turned and looked at him and he said, man, don't you even have enough good sense to understand that this thing you're involved in is terminal? You're dying, man. It's over. 
This man has done nothing wrong. We have. He is dying for no good reason. You see, that man crossed a very important line in acknowledging that Jesus Christ was sinless. Without doubt, there's some of you sitting in this place that do not yet know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and your key problem is you are unwilling to humble yourself and acknowledge Jesus Christ as being sinless, and you are a sinner needing his substitutionary death on your behalf in order to bring salvation to you. You can't cross that line. You want to see Jesus as a good man rather than say, if he told lies, he was not a good man, and Time and again he said, I am the Son of God. I am one with the Father. I am the Messiah. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody gets to God the Father except through me. And you find yourself stumbling at that point and being unwilling to say, he was not a good man, for he told lies. Because as yet you've not been able to kneel before him and say, I am a sinner and he is the Savior and I need his forgiveness in order to be born into the family of God. Jesus turned and looked at that criminal on the cross and said, today you will be with me in paradise. Why? because he crossed that line and acknowledged Jesus Christ as the sinless Son of God who was not dying for his own sins, but was dying for the sins of others. You see, they all found peace and joy when they followed the counsel that Jesus gave to them. And the question is, are you finding peace and joy in your life because of a willingness to follow the counsel of Jesus through the Word of God? Or do you find this Word to be kind of boring, kind of uninteresting, or too prying? Wonderful Counselor, for that's who He is. Mighty God, able to save not only from sin, but to save us from our enemies even through the great stress that Satan would bring into our lives as he attacks our families. There's been a great volume of prayer this week in this community and out of this church especially on behalf of Willie and Julia Brown and their family and the death of their grandson. The attack of Satan comes so strongly when Satan attacks us through our children, through our grandchildren. And the grief is heavy for the loss is great. As I stopped by the house yesterday and had some time with Julia and Glenn were there, Julia's comment to me was this, there is a peace that passes human understanding that is ours in this family and we thank God for that and we know it's the result of the prayers of God's people and I encourage you this morning don't quit praying for them for they need the undergirding of our prayers and they know that and they ask for that and they open themselves to that by being here in this service and worshiping with us at this hour I'm grateful for that Mighty God, able to save and able to bring us through the circumstances that are so heavy in this life. Thirdly, we see him as the everlasting father. You say, how can he be the everlasting father when he was the son? Well, we're focusing on his character when we speak of him as being the everlasting father. He is approachable. with kindness, with understanding, and with acceptance, he welcomes all who will come to him. You know, the only time I ever had difficulty approaching my dad is when I knew I was dead wrong. When I knew everything was really great, it was easy to move in there because I knew that he loved me, I knew he cared for me, 
and I knew it was open to my approach. And if you can see yourself as someone that God loves and cares for and can begin to see Jesus Christ as one who gave himself that you might live, you begin to find what God has for you. Finally, he's the Prince of Peace. A ruler who seeks peace, not war. I heard a news item a day or two ago that at some auction where they were selling a cap that had been worn by Adolf Hitler, they thought it would bring up to $40,000 in this auction, thinking surely someone would want this priceless item And they couldn't get the bid anywhere near what they wanted. And they finally had to set it aside and decide that maybe later it'll be worth more and they'll sell it later. Adolf Hitler was a ruler who wanted war. He didn't want peace. Jesus came as the prince of peace and he sought peace not at any price but at the right price. See, when you understand what the scripture says in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, it says God was in Christ restoring the world to himself, no longer counting men's sins against them, but blotting them out. This is the wonderful message he has given us to share with others. We are Christ's ambassadors, and God is using us to speak to you. We beg you as though Christ himself were here pleading with you, receive the love he offers you. Be reconciled to God. For God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sins. And then in exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. That's the peace that he brought, the peace we read about in Romans 3, where Mitch read for you that God declares us not guilty of offending him if we trust in Jesus Christ, who in his kindness freely takes away our sins for God sent Christ Jesus to take the punishment for our sins and to end all of God's anger against us. He used Christ's blood and our faith as the means of saving us from his wrath. The Prince of Peace, that's truly who he is. And the world wants to find peace, but they want to detour around Jesus Christ and there's no way. It won't work. He can give us peace with God, he can give us peace with ourselves, and he can give us peace with others if we will trust him and take steps to learn how to trust him more. How can these names help you as an individual function more effectively? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Well, I think, first of all, we need to meditate on these names. Meditate on these names. When you think about Jesus, I think you do as I do. It's so easy to see a picture that someone has drawn, whether it's Phil Hook with that rugged picture of Jesus that I really like, or that Solomon's head of Christ that really doesn't have the strong, virile look that I like. Maybe it's some other rugged picture that's never become very popular. But I ask you to set that aside this morning and begin to meditate on these names as you think about Jesus as the wonderful counselor who would help you out of the strait you're in if you knew how to trust him. Of the mighty God, of the everlasting Father, of the Prince of Peace. You may be living in a situation that is so filled with all kinds of war. that you have not yet learned how to trust him to bring you to that place. Meditate on these names. Secondly, seek him in each one of these four roles. In that area where you say, I wish that I could be communicated with by the Lord himself, seek him in one of those four areas that's special to you today. Thirdly, examine yourself. Where are you failing to let him relate to you. It's an amazing thing that we can set up the roadblocks and God will honor the roadblocks that we set up. That's amazing. 
How can God function by allowing us to be in charge? God doesn't come in with some steamroller and say, I am going to run over you. You are going to listen to me. You are going to do what I tell you to. God allows us to make a choice. And if we elect to tell him to leave us alone, he will follow our wish. And finally, take some time to worship him just because of who he is. Not for what he's done, but for who he is. And see him in these four roles. And allow him to bring the step that needs to be taken in your life. I don't know what that step is for you. That may be the step to say, I need to talk to someone about my personal salvation. I have not yet come to Jesus Christ. And if you'd pull that card out of the rack and fill it out and put it in one of these boxes by the door, we'll have somebody sitting with you in a private place of your choosing to open the scriptures with you and answer your question. Perhaps you're a believer whose life is really on the ragged edge because you've refused to be obedient to the word. You believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You've invited him into your life, but you've elected to retain the right to run your own life. And you're finding this thing called the Christian life is not full of joy and delight at all. It's a pain. I would encourage you, take time to worship him for who he is. Your assignment this week, read Isaiah 9, 6. Go over those four names. Read 2 Corinthians 5, verses 19 to 21. Do these every day. And read Romans 3, verses 21 to 28. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 to 21. And Romans 3, 21 to 28. Hook to Isaiah 9, 6. We can help you. We want to. We wait for your invitation. Stand together with me as we pray and as we go. Father, we thank you for the privilege to open the Word of God. We have seen you through the music of the kids and of the choir and of Jack. And through the opening of your word, we have seen you. We want to worship you just because of who you are, rather than to always be thinking about what you've done. What a step of maturity it is to begin to worship you just for who you are. I pray that as the Spirit of God works, that there would be that proper response. Bless us as we go. Bless us as we read this week. Bring us together in various Bible studies and times of contact to be encouraged in our faith. We'll give you thanks for this. In the name of the living Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you. Good to be with you. Come again. Hope to see you in a Bible study somewhere this week.